I'll talk fast so y'all can listen fast, but we've had one of our own uh, that's been defending our country for the last year in Afghanistan, one of the hottest spots in the world right now, and I love him, and I know y'all do too. David Allen, stand up and let us give you a hand. You know, we prayed over him before he left. We asked God to take care of him and protect him, and God did just that. And so we, we praise God for that. Buddy, glad to have you back. Let's go hunting or something, right? <laughs> Amen. Well, you know, our guys this year, we've done our, um, our, our Series 33, if you guys were at the men's um, small group. And, you know, the topics that we talked about was all about looking at ourselves to make ourselves you know better men and we all I think want to be better uh, than what we are I mean we all struggle and we all fight temptation we all hope and dream about being a, a difference maker but sometimes the world just seems to push us back and push us into submission you know Derry was talking about this morning you know how the uh, how the spies were trying to trap Jesus uh, when they asked him, uh, you know, should we, you know, should we pay taxes? And 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 of course Jesus was so smart and was able to to respond back to him. Hey, listen, give what uh, is Caesar unto Caesar, but give what is God unto God. But it seems like that the world is just pushing on our men so hard that it makes it difficult. But I'm gonna tell you this: <laughs> God is still in control. God is still in charge. And real men can still be real men. And one thing I know for sure in life, with all the mistakes that I make and with all the stake mistakes that I have made and with all the times that I've not been the best father that I, that I know I, I should have been, I can tell you this, that being a man of God does not happen by mistake. A man of God happens because you work at it, because you struggle through the obstacles that come into you at life. So I titled the sermon this morning, The Man I Want to Be. And uh, I was looking through several things this week, trying to think of something just a little bit different and pull some things out maybe we hadn't talked about before. And so I, I've chosen kind of an, an odd character, but, but if you'll look at his life, I think that it'll make sense. So turn with me to the book of Numbers, to the book of Numbers, right at the, at the beginning of the Bible there. Turn with me to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. There's a whole lot of story here, and I don't have time to read it all, but just let me give you the beginnings of the story, the introduction, and then we'll be at chapter 13 in just a minute. But this is the time in history that God had used Moses to lead the Israelites out of their bondage in Egypt. It's the time when he had led them through the Red Sea. And then after he went through the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army tried to follow him. The waters came back down upon him. This is the time uh, when he took them up to, uh, to, to Mount Sinai and, he, and, and, and uh, God delivered to Moses the Ten Commandments. This is the time where they had came up to the southern part of what would be the promised land and that he sent t uh, 12 spies uh, into this promised land to see if it could be taken. Now... We always hear that, and I said it, but can I just tell you this, that, that God already knew that the land could be taken. Would you agree with that? God already had a plan and a purpose for the, life, with, for the lives of these Israelites. Do you agree with that? He had already promised Abraham that this promised land would be given to this group of people, God's chosen people. So why do you think that God had Moses sent 12 spies in there to see if the land could be taken. It wasn't for God's benefit because God already knew the plan. It was for their own benefit to see if their faith was strong enough for them to go into that area and know that they couldn't do it on their own. They came back knowing that they couldn't do it on their own. The difference between the ten men and the two men was that the ten men saw with earthly eyes and knew that it couldn't be done. The two men, Joshua and the guy we're going to talk about today, Caleb, saw the land and knew that it could only be taken with the help of God now let me just tell you this men let me just just let me just do a cheerleader for you right now you'll not be a man of God without God being in your life you, you'll not be a man of God without just pouring yourself out to God and like Paul said I'm I, I'm just I'm just pouring myself out like a drink offering you'll not be a man of God unless you seek God because it's impossible to do on your own so, um, so he sent these 12 spies 
into, into the promised land. They stayed there for 40 days. They came back, and starting in verse 26 of chapter 13 of Numbers, this is the report that they gave back uh, to Moses. So chapter 13 of Numbers and verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. They, uh, there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. And the descendants of Anak is where, the, uh, where Goliath and his brothers came from, the, the big, huge uh, men that we read about uh, there in, in 1 Samuel. And the, the Amalekites live there in, in the Negev, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites live in the hill country, that's the middle, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan River. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said this. Caleb spoke up. Caleb said, we should go and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody said something, you so vehemently disagreed with them that it shocked you? That's what happened right here. But the men who had gone up with him, the, the, the ten men, not Joshua, but the, but the ten that had gone as well, they said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak came from the, from the Nephilim, and we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. In other words, they looked huge to us, and we looked small to them. And I'm going to tell you what, right now, folks, right now, men, the world looks at us, and they see us as small. And we look at the world, and many times we see the world as large. We see ourselves when we go out into the community, and everybody else is telling a dirty joke, and we laugh right along with them. Everybody else is talking and has foul language coming out of their mouth, and we talk the same way. Everybody else is looking at pornography, and so we look at pornography as well. Everybody else is, is just doing just like the world, and we walk right along with them. Why? Because they seem big to us, and we seem small to them. But today, I want to tell you that there are some Caleb's in this auditorium. There are some Caleb's that have said, you know what? The world can act just like the world wants to. But as for me and my family, we are going to serve the Lord. So when they came back, ten of the leaders said the land was filled with giants. There was no way that they could beat them. But two of the men, two of the men, Joshua and Caleb, they were different. They told people to trust God and God would give them the victory. And listen, that's the kind of man that I want to be. Let's pray. Father, I just come to you right now. I pray, Father, that you'd speak through this sermon this morning. That, Lord, it would be an encouragement to our guys, Lord. Lord, it's not my intention to step on toes this morning, Lord, but just to come up alongside these men and to form partnerships with them, Lord. That we'd all go out together. Because, Lord, we all fail. We all struggle. We all have temptations. Lord, your word says that all our temptations are common, Lord, but that with that temptation that you're faithful and you'll always make a way that we may bear it. So, Father, I pray this morning that our men would just hear from you this morning, Lord. I pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you move on over to the 14th chapter uh, of Numbers, just go to that next chapter. We've built the story along to this point here, and I can tell you that God is not happy. He's brought them all through these. He's showed them how great he is. If you go all the way back to their bondage in, 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 uh, in Egypt and how God would sent uh, them through all the plagues, and now we're at the point where God has delivered them from all of that, brought them to the land that he had promised his forefathers, and the people said, no, we can't do that. Have we ever been there, church? Have we ever been to that point where we needed to do something, we wanted to do something, it looked like God had given us the ability to do something, and yet we stepped back and said, oh, we don't have enough money to do that. Or, no, I don't know that we want to risk doing that. Let me tell you what. God is a risk-taking God because God knows the plans that he has for you, and it's not plans for you to fail, but plans for you to see. And the first point I want you to see here, guys, is that a man of God sees the world with different eyes. A man of God sees the world with different eyes. Look at chapter 14, verse 1 here in the book of Numbers. It says, that night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. 
All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, if we'd only died in Egypt. Does that sound familiar to you? If it does, and it should, because they did the same thing that they were when they were at the Red Sea and they saw the water out in front of them and they saw Pharaoh's army coming and they said, well, you should have let us die in Egypt. And Moses says, no, wait a minute. God's still in charge here. He raised his staff up. You know what happened? There was a pillar of fire that kept Pharaoh from coming in, and the sea opened up and allowed them to walk across on dry land. These people had all done that. You say, Johnny, calm down. I can't help it. Let me tell you what, when God does something amazing in your life, and then you go just a while after that, and you forget completely about it, if I was God, I wouldn't be happy either, would you? So look here, verse 3. Why is the Lord bringing us out of this land only to let us uh, fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it have been better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Can I tell you that when we come into turmoil, when we come into strife, when we come into problems, we've got one of two choices, guys, girls, ladies, everybody, we can either run to Jesus or we can run away from Jesus. And these people right here, there was 10 of them, and they spread the word through the whole community. Let's go back to where we were. It wasn't good, but at least we knew where we were going. At least we knew what we had. Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron said, don't you remember the bondage that you were in? You're free right now, but freedom requires commitment. And Joshua and Caleb looked at things through a different set of eyes and said, you know what, if God can be for us, who can be against us? Look on. Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, watch this, the land we pass through and explored is exceedingly good. The life God has for us, guys, is exceedingly good. Let's do this, verse 8. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only don't rebel against the Lord. Guys, you need to hear this because I, I tell you, this, this tweaked my heart, and I hope it does yours. And do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. There were 12, 12 men that went into the promised land. Ten saw the land through their own eyes, and two saw the land through God's eyes. Why? Because they had a relationship with God. They knew that, that, that they could trust him because they had watched his work. They had seen him at work. That they were there when God moved them out of Egypt. They were there when God opened the Red Sea. They were there when God gave them the Ten Commandments. You say, well, yeah, so were the other ten. And you'd be right. So what's the difference? The difference is that Joshua and Caleb saw those miracles in a different way. That They used those experiences of seeing God in action. They used that to grow their faith. That, listen, that's what we have to do. Remember that, that time in the book of 1 Samuel? We've been studying David on Wednesday nights. And we studied this about Goliath a while back. But when David went to, um, went to the battle there and saw Goliath on, out on the field, he says, I'll go out there and take care of him. This teenager, this guy that was too young to actually be in the battle that was home taking care of the sheep that brought the lunch bucket to his brothers said, why, why are you all allowing that to happen? I can stand up and I can do it. I'll go kill him. Saul, the king, says, no, you can't. Well, okay, maybe you can. Put on all my armor. No, it's not going to work out. Let me just do what I've done before. Why? Because God took care of me. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 36, the Bible says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Now watch this. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Why? Because he had already had experiences with God and those experiences shaped and created him into the man that God wanted him to be. Listen, I want to be like that, but I'll not be like that unless I remember what God has done for me in the past. Listen, we have our faith based on what 
we believe in. And what we believe in, we believe in because of what God's done in our life and in the lives of others. And when, I see, you know, and when I've got a little cold or when I don't feel just the greatest in the world, I think of somebody that's got a pacemaker in their chest that's working 90% of the time. I, I, I think about somebody that's been through that, something that's harder. And I, and I feel bad because I'm having a lack of faith. But it causes me to want to stand up and say, listen, if she can do it, I can do it. If he can do it, I can do it. If they can do it, we can do it. And I'm telling you guys, you know, if you want to be a man like God, if you want to be that kind of guy, then you're going to have to step out into faith into some areas that you really can't see. You're going to have to step out and go boldly into some areas that look impossible. But you've got to see life you got to see life different than other people do. Is that easy? No, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? So I'm just telling you guys that, whenever, you know, that a man of God sees life differently than other people do. Number two, a man of God acts differently too. He acts, a man of God acts differently than other men act. Look, I'm telling you, God's very upset with the people, uh, with, with, with his people here. But, he, but Moses talks with him. In fact, if you'll read that whole story, God says, I think I'll just do away with them. And Moses tells him, well, look, God, you know, you've took them out of Egypt and everything, and if you do away with them now, the people over in, in Egypt will say, well, he had enough power to get them out of Egypt, but he didn't, didn't have enough power to get them. You know, so Moses you know, gave a very, a very, a very good uh, argument to God to keep these people alive, and God said, okay, I'll forgive them. Look at verse, verse 20, chapter 14. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert but disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one, no one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But watch this. But because, because... My servant, Caleb, has a different spirit. I'm going to tell you what, Christian men, we need people to look around and see men, godly men, God, uh, men who love God and who are called according to his purpose and look at men and go, you know what, I just see men getting worse and worse and worse. And I just see this world getting worse and worse and worse. But I was down there at Lakeview Church. And I saw some men who love God. I was down there at Lakeview Church, and I saw some people who love folks. I, I was down there at Lakeview. You know, the world's going to, you know, wearing a hand basket. But I was down there at Lakeview, and I saw some men doing godly things. There's still hope. There only might be two out of 12. But I'm telling you, there's a remnant to be had. Watch what he says about Caleb. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants <clears throat> will inherit it. A couple things I want you to see about this, this passage, maybe three if I get to it. The first is this, you must follow the Lord completely. You'll never be happy in your Christian life. Let me tell you what, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a good example of a bad example. I like that saying, Perry. When I ride the fence, I am an unhappy Christian. How about you guys? And I know when I'm doing it. And I know when I'm not following God wholeheartedly and completely. I, I know when I'm trying to, 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 to just kind of ride the fence. I know when I'm hiding behind the bushel. I, I know when, I, when I'm ready to let somebody else stand out in front. I know when I'm quiet and somebody else is saying something bad about somebody. I, I know when I'm doing that. I, I, I know it. Sometimes I have the courage to stand up and say, you know what, but I like them anyway. Sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. But I'm going to tell you what, the man I want to be, the man I'm encouraged to be, the man I'm challenged to be by God is the one that stands up every time. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to be ugly. Jesus, you know, he wasn't that way unless he had to be. So many times he just turned their words back on them, and they condemned themselves but we got to follow the Lord completely. Can I just tell you for a second, guys? You know, I don't know whether you, 
you know, ladies, y'all can just read the Bible yourself, but it says, the Bible says that the man's to be the spiritual leader of the home. That's what it says. Now, you can agree with that or you can disagree with it, but if you disagree with it, you're just disagreeing with the Bible, but you just read it any way you want to. But I'm telling you, guys, that we're to be the spiritual leader of the family. We're to stand up for what is right. Most of the time, we know what's right and wrong. And so can I just tell you that when you're on the phone with somebody, maybe you decide to play hooky from work some morning and you're on the phone with your boss and you're lying to your boss and telling them you're sick when you're really not and your child's sitting right there on the bed, not good. You know, when you're selling something and you're hiding what it is, remember the old Andy Griffith show where Andy has sold something to somebody and and he's not told them the bad things about it. Little Opie then tells the guy, you know, he sells a bicycle, right, and does the same kind of thing. Andy gets on to Opie for selling the bicycle with problems. And then then Opie looks at his dad and says, well, Dad, why'd you sell the company? Guys, we got to do what's right. And we got to do it completely. And not only must we do it completely, but we got to follow the Lord consistently and what that means guys is we don't have the choice <laughs> I don't feel like being good today oh man I just got out of a good service and I'm feeling good I got a good night's sleep you know what today I'm gonna be good listen we got to be good whether we feel like it or not it's not about emotion it's about having integrity it's about getting up every day and going to work whether you feel like it or not It's about every time when you sell something that you tell about what's wrong with it or what's right with it. It's about every time telling what's truthful and right and just. And can I tell you, the same kids that will learn from your mistakes will learn from the good things in your life as well. You know, if if you look in in Joshua chapter 14, you don't have to go there. I'll just tell you about this. You'll see that Caleb did go to the promised land and that he was given the very land that God had promised him 45 years earlier that he would have as a spy. And if you even go farther, you'll see that there was some, that there was some pretty mean guys in that area. In fact, if you'll read it, it says the guys had six fingers and six toes on each hand and on each foot. And nobody else wanted to go in there and take care of them. And even at his older age, Caleb says, you know what, here am I. Just, I'll go do it. Because you know why? Because not only did... Uh, uh, not only did he, did he follow him completely and consistently, because, but he also followed the Lord faithfully. Now, when I say faithfully, I'm telling you that Caleb and Joshua followed God with faith. When Caleb and, and the other spies, you know, returned from the promised land and gave their reports and talked about giants and walled cities, all they could see was the obstacles. They wanted to return to Egypt and go back to the things they had before and let's not worry about it. But not Caleb. Caleb says, you know what? We can make this thing happen. And can I, just, can I just remind you of one thing? When they came back after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, when they came back on the east side of the Jordan River and they were about to cross over and Joshua was in charge of them because Moses had passed away, he sent three spies over and he said, you come back and tell me what we're up against, but not so we'll know whether or not we can come or not, but just so we'll be able to know how we're going to plan the battle. And then you'll find after that, that after they got their report and Joshua was walking along the, the, uh, the, the river, Riverbank there, all of a sudden, here comes Jesus manifested, and, and, and Joshua says, You know, what are you here for? Are you here for us or our enemies? He says, I'm not here for either one. I'm here to be in control. Can I just tell you that when you have faith, whoo, Lord in mercy, when you have faithfulness and when you give God everything you got and you don't take nothing in for yourself, but instead you just pour yourself out to God, God comes along and He says, Let me just walk with you, buddy. Let me just walk with you. And guys, you can do that, and I can do it. Will you do it every time? No, but we're not going to use it for an excuse to not do it. Well, isn't God good? Last point. A man of God enjoys rewards that others miss. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, you got this mountain in front of you and, you know, the book of James, it talks about, you know, You'll be in, you know, when you come into times of various and sundry trials, to be faithful, right? If you can do that, guys, there are some amazing rewards that you'll have in your life. Look at verse 36. Num- go back to Numbers chapter 14, verse 36. 
So the men Moses had sent in to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. These men, uh, these men responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Zephaniah, survived. <laughs> Can I just tell you, we've got some great old fellas in this church. Great older gentlemen. Guys that I look up to and y'all do too. Guys that it just seems like that when they pray, God listens a little more intently. Guys that have went in and just battled. And, and, and they can't do as much physically as they used to could. But when you come up to them and you hug them, you know that you've hugged somebody that loves God. Of the ones who went to explore the land, only Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Zephaniah, survived. Now, I know they're talking about here physical death, but can I just tell you, the men who stay true to the course of God survive in a spiritual sense. And not only do they survive, they thrive. In, in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 8, and verse 34, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me, and, and other translations say for my sake, and for the gospel will save it. Heard a story about Queen Elizabeth of England. She asked a merchant to go over to Holland to take, uh, to take care of some business for her. When she told him, what she had in mind, the business owner said, well, well Queen, you, you know, your, your Majesty, Your Highness, whatever it is, this, this, if, if I do that, if I take care of your business, my business will be ruined. The Queen looked back at the businessman, to the businessman and said, you take care of my business and I will take care of yours. The same is true of God. When you're willing to give your life to serve God, when you're willing to be a man of integrity in all things, no matter what it costs you. Whenever, if you're willing to stand up when everybody else has fallen away, people will look at you and they will criticize you and they will scorn you. But I'm going to tell you something else. They'll remember you. They'll remember you. And I'll tell you this. When times are bad, everybody always looks not for the man of dishonesty, not for the man of disintegrity, if that's a word, but they look for men that know Christ. Man, I'm telling you, we've had some incredible bad things happen in our country. The Shady Hook School, the you know, 9-11, all the different things going on. Can I tell you that people always look for people of faith in times of problems? And can I tell you something else? You know, you always hear about giving to the Red Cross. I'll hustle through this. I know this, I'm chasing a rabbit, but the Red Cross is always the first ones in it, disaster. You know who the Red Cross uses to go in and feed people? Southern Baptist more than anybody else we get there before the Red Cross gets there why because we've got men of integrity that are willing to stand up and give everything for Christ in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 the Bible says but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you as well I, I love what Paul told his young student Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 Paul is coming to the end of his life and he knows it and he says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time, of, the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the course. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all, to all who have longed for his appearing. Guys, I'm going to tell you, people look for people of integrity they look for men of integrity we owe it to our family we owe it to our kids we owe it to our church but more than all of that we owe it to a God who loved us and gave his all for us in the beginning people made fun of Caleb they wanted to stone him and Joshua if you all remember he had no respect and no honor but then 40 years later after everybody else had died Everybody under 40 that came to that place where they were going in, they all died. The only exceptions was Joshua and Caleb. Do you think that they might have been men of honor at that point? 
Do you think that their walk caused the people around them? Do you think that when they were sitting around the fires at night that people might have been asking them, hey, what was it like in Egypt? Oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. How, how was it like when all those plagues were coming along? Well, let me tell you what God did. How, how was it like when you came to the Red Sea and you were so afraid? I wasn't afraid. God had took care of us in such an amazing way. We didn't know what was going to happen. We just knew something was going to happen. How would you feel when you saw the Red Sea open up? I felt like I was in the presence of God. What, what was it like when Moses came down off of that mountain with those Ten Commandments? I knew that God was close and that he had spoke to us. How did you feel when you went over there and saw the descendants of Anak, those big, huge guys? He said, I, I just knew I could do anything if God was there. How does it feel to be ready to go into the promised land? Are you not scared? I mean, the walls of Jericho are huge and thick, and there's two of them, and there's kill zones everywhere. Oh, but young man, God didn't place us here to let us fail now. Men, the Lord's looking, and he's issuing a call for godly men. He's looking for men who will take up the call and follow him. He's looking for men who will walk with him consistently and constantly and stand up for what's right and who will invest their lives in something that will last the question I have for you men today here is are you that kind of man listen don't don't pattern your life after me I'll I'll I'll, I'll hurt you I'll disappoint you don't, don't pattern your life after somebody else that's less than you or greater than you because that's not the mark we're looking for, is it? Guys, can I just tell you that if you pattern your life after Christ, that you may fail because you don't do what's right, but if you're always looking to God as the bar, you'll always come out on the other side better than what you were. Can, will your children remember how you loved the Lord? Will they remember seeing you reading the Bible? Has your children ever heard you pray? Will they remember how your walk impacted every relationship and how it impacted your attitude during the week? Will they have a memory of how God blessed you because he was first in your lives? It's a question to ponder. Now many of you will stay right in your seats and you'll just sit there and say, well, I don't need to come up to that altar. And maybe you don't. Or maybe... Your children, your friends, the ones close to you need to see you step out for God. Maybe they never have. Maybe it's the time for you to stand up, get up, speak up, and come to this altar and pray to God. Now, ladies, you've had a pretty easy time this morning, haven't you? How long has it been since you prayed for your husband? How long has it been since you've told him verbally well he just knows it no how long has it been since you told him verbally how special he is to you how long has it been since you've honored him well if he was worthy of honor I'd get it doesn't say that maybe this morning is the time where we come together as families I was at First Baptist Church of Houston last Sunday morning Pastor Greg Mott said you know what how long has it been since you got down on a concrete floor theirs looks much like ours and your knees hurt because you prayed. Cheryl and I got on our knees on that concrete floor and we prayed for you and we prayed for ourselves. At the end of the day, a man of integrity, a woman of integrity will stand up on their own two feet and make a stand for God. What's God asking you to do this morning? Will you stand with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm gonna pray for you. And right after that prayer, if God's calling you to something, if there's a question that he has for you, I've got prayer partners lining the front here. Folks are going to be at the altar this morning. If you want to grab a prayer partner, you come right on. We'll be singing, but as soon as I say amen, I want you to make your way to this altar. Father.